All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our sixth edition BCBA task list series. Today we're continuing concepts and principles with B23. Identify ways matching law can be used to interpret response allocation. Now, what we're going to go over can feel a little complex at first, especially because there's an actual formula that we can use to calculate matching law. But we want to view this in terms of practical application when you are providing services in the field. And that is what responses are going to appear more and why will those responses appear more, whether they're responses we want to encourage or not encourage. So as always, we're going to simplify this for your exam and to make you a better practitioner. If you aren't already, please like and subscribe. We've got three BCBA videos a week. We also do RBT content. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our famous combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard, let's get going. So we're actually going to start with response allocation instead of matching law, because we've got to understand response allocation first. Response allocation describes how a person distributes responses among available options in any given environment. So in other words, a person's time and effort distributed across response A versus B versus C. When you wake up, you're making choices of what to do first. Do you get on your phone in bed and play on your phone for 30 minutes, or do you get up and start your day? These are choices in your environment. And every time we're making choices, we are allocating responses. And those responses are influenced by reinforcement schedules and relative rates of reinforcement. There are a couple other things like response effort that we're going to cover. But in general, response allocation are influenced by reinforcement schedules and relative rates of reinforcement. What we're saying, if you have 100% available response, so you've got 100% of your responses available. We're saying you will allocate your responses a certain percentage to A and a certain percentage to B. There's only so much time in the day. There's only so much time to engage in responses. How will those responses be distributed based on the reinforcement they acquire? Now, matching law attempts to quantify, so numbers, right, numbers quantify response allocation and says relative rate of responding matches relative rate of reinforcement. So what does that mean? It means your responses are distributed based on the amount of reinforcement that each response produces. So if response A gets re reinforcement on an FR2 and response B gets reinforcement on an FR4, what does matching law say? Well, it says a is going to happen more than B. Why? Well, if I do A four times, I get two reinforcement. If I do B four times, I get one. That's matching law. That's response allocation. If you want to have a formula, this is the formula. It's very basic. Now, do I recommend memorizing this? If you have mastered everything else and you're fluent 100% and you really want to get to that next level, Sure, memorize this formula, right? You might see it on an exam, you might not. But if we're just keeping it simple, if you've got a reinforcement schedule that's providing you reinforcement every twice for four responses and a reinforcement schedule that's providing you reinforcement once for four responses, it's common sense that we're going to engage in A to get us to reinforcement. Now, matching law is associated with concurrent schedules of reinforcement. Remember our compound schedules, where two or more independent schedules of reinforcement are available at the same time. And a lot of our day-to-day -day life is operating on these concurrent schedules. We want to use a lot of concurrent schedules with our clients and learners to give them the illusion or the actual responsibility of choice. So... Simply put, if there are two buttons to press, each button, each button leads to a different reinforcement schedule. Concurrent schedules, there are, mo there are multiple responses available to engage in. 
each with its own reinforcement. If you've got a child sitting in class, they can raise their hand quietly and get called on. They can scream out the answer and get attention. They can fall out of their seat and get kicked out of class. All these responses are available. Which ones are going to be reinforced? That's what we're trying to figure out. Responses will be allocated to each button proportionally to reinforcement obtained. Now let's go back to the very beginning. Well, Skinner developed this or, 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 or was, was analyzing this using his pigeons and his Skinner box. In his Skinner box, these were keys, but I'm just using buttons as a, as a different example. You have button A, which provides food on a variable interval 30 seconds schedule. 30 seconds pass, once a response happens, reinforced. Button B provides food on a VI 60 second schedule. So you've got to wait twice as long, timer-wise, for button B. Now, what's, what's going to happen? Well, matching law says responses will be allocated to A about twice as often as B because A provides reinforcement twice as often. Now, if you plug all that in that formula, 67% of PEX on A, 33% on B. And those numbers can change, right? If, if this was a VI 15 versus a 60, then this would go up and this would go down. Now, you might be saying, well, it's impossible to predict with 100% certainty. Of course, it's human behavior, but we've got to have these guidelines. We've got to have these proven ideas to help shape how we view behavior. So why are some responses more persistent or preferred for certain activities? Because it is very easy to say, well, this one receives more reinforcement. It's going to happen more. But there are other ways to alter reinforcement because if we just went by that, that's going to be difficult to change quickly. Let's say the, the, the behavior we want to eliminate is receiving reinforcement at four times the rate of the replacement behavior we want to see. Well, sure, we can change the amount of reinforcement allocated, but we can also change the reinforcer magnitude. Give a bigger, better reinforcer for the replacement. It can lead to higher response allocation. You can improve the quality. You can use more preferred reinforcement for the replacement. And the response effort. Responses requiring less effort may receive high allocation for similar reinforcement rates. If we make it easier to engage in the positive or the behavior we want to see, easier than the behavior we want to replace, then we're lowering the response effort and the odds say that it's more likely that the learner will engage in that behavior. So not only is it the amount, but it's the magnitude, the quality, and the response effort. You've got to consider all those things when comparing why certain responses are happening and certain ones are not. So key takeaways, right? Again, super simple, but it can really get as in the weeds as you want. Think about response allocation, how an individual distributes their behavior among options. I have option one, door number one, door number two, door number three. Matching law predicts relative rate of responding matches the relative rate of reinforcement. If door number one is FR10, door number two is FR1, door number three is FR50, which one are we going to likely go to? Well, number two, given the opportunity, and then number one and number three. And this is going to happen a lot more than number three. Now, problem behavior and concurrent schedules, this helps understand why challenging behavior persists, right? If we've been working to get challenging behaviors out of the repertoire, well, are those challenging behaviors receiving more reinforcement than the behavior we want to see? Is the attention greater, right? Is the magnitude greater? Is it easier to engage in the challenging behavior? Consider these things. Preference for activities, again, explain why individuals spend more time on activities. And then we have this idea of deviations where, where undermatching and overmatching occur. And that's just if response allocation is not perfectly proportional to reinforcement rates. The thing is, deviations will almost always occur because it's human behavior. So that formula we showed is, is almost never going to be perfect, but it's going to give you a good idea of what you can expect in terms of 
responses based on the reinforcement you're providing. I hope that makes a little more sense. Again, don't complicate it. Don't, don't overthink it. Keep it simple, right? Response allocation is based on matching law. Responses that receive more reinforcement tend to happen more. Almost as simple as that, right? Like, subscribe if you haven't already. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout-out. Work hard, study hard. We'll see you soon.